So whatever goes on in class is good. I'll forget about it, you'll forget about it, it's all good. I've had students for uh, years who are discipline problems in my class and the next day we're best of friends and I'm like, don't you remember what he did? I don't, so it's good. Uh, but the biggest thing is, this room, these rooms echo really, really bad and it really messes up my hearing. So when you talk to me, or when you talk and you have something to say in class, make sure you say it loud and clear. Because being in this room is like being underwater for my hearing. It's just like I'm hearing all this going on in my head. So just speak up loud and clear, okay? And if you, um, you missed out on whatever's going on in his life, <laughs> don't know what it, don't, I have no idea what it was, but it was pretty funny. So they'll, they'll catch you up on it, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> last quarter was really, really weird. It was, uh, it was great doing the online stuff, but it's really good to be back in a room. Um, for those people that, there are people out there somewhere, I guess. For those people that are not here, we miss you. Wish you could come back in the class and um, look forward to hearing everybody's input on what we're doing here. Before we go any further, I'm going to open up a prayer. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for each family represented here. I thank you for those that could not be here, Lord God, but I just pray for each and every one, Lord. I thank you for carrying us through all of the different situations that we're going through in our lives, Lord. And we thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity just to, to learn and, and grow, Lord. And I just lift each student up to you that, that you would give them, Lord God, an open mind and an open heart that they would absorb um, whatever it is that, that we're going to be learning, Lord, that whatever each one of us is sharing, Father, that we would be willing to share our, our thoughts and, and share our beliefs, Lord, and also be able to understand other thoughts, Lord. So I just give this time over to you. I thank you for your wisdom and guidance, and I just pray for it, Lord, now. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, we're going to be planning a field trip, and I'm going to need your help on the field trip, okay? Um, I guess I should call roll two before we go any further. But the field trip currently, we can go to several different places. I should put this on the board. Um, I'm going to put on my reading glasses so I can read this. We can go to the boyhood home of Woodrow Wilson, Jimmy Carter Library and Museum, President Roosevelt's Little White House, Martin Luther King Center, Martin Luther King National Historic Park, Georgia Governor's Mansion, or the Georgia State Capitol, or some of the other thing, other places that you can think of that we can go to. Some of these places are like two hours away, so I don't think they're legit for, for us to be able to go to on a field trip. Because that's like four hours travel time to spend, you know, even if we spent a couple of hours someplace, it's a lot of travel time to, uh, for, for a one day field trip. But think about it, think of some of the places you might want to go to. Um, it's not until the end of this class. So we have time to think about it. We gotta start preparing for it, start planning for it. Um, so I kinda have to narrow that down. But if you have an idea, shoot me an email, let me know, okay? Uh, I'm thinking someplace like the Georgia Governor's Mansion, which is down near Buckhead, I think. Uh, Martin Luther King Center, which is down in Atlanta. Uh, some of the other places, forget Woodrow Wilson's home, I think is near Augusta. That's like almost two hours away, I think. So that might be too far away. But if one of these places is, is someplace that you'd really like to go to, let me know. If you can think of someplace else, let me know. Be something to do. There was supposed to be a handout. The handout was supposed to be the, um, the syllabus, I think it was. Um, yeah, the syllabus highlights. 
but I, I can project some things on the screen. This is going to be on the Gradelink page. So if you go on Gradelink, you can see these ideas. You can click on them and get an idea where they would be just to um, help us out. Okay? All right. Let me call the roll quick. Kaysen? Here. Bennett? Bennett Clark? Oh. Wow. <laughs> You're going to be like that? Oh, that was painful. I heard. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting. I thought it was saying the same flat. I didn't bring it. All these things out. See, now if I had said your first name, Bennett. you would have said, no, I'm Bennett, like his last name. <laughs> True. I, just, All right. I don't know. Uh, it's the bad. first day of thing. Well, Caitlin. Here. Here. Christian. Christian not here. Lucy. Here. Teddy's not here. Abby. Abby Reeves. Abby is here. Abby Reeves is not here. Abby Reeves is not here. And Abby's here. Oh, you guys are all exceptional. Definitely. Definitely. Is that Bennett? Yeah. Okay, good. I think it was that. Your hair. That's the next time I said. Are you done talking over that? <laughs> I don't know. I'm gonna let that go. Just wait. Okay. Anybody know what this class is about? American government. American what? American government. American government. Okay. American government. Uh, I get these notes, which is really cool. One of the things it says is to share a little, little bit about yourself. And something personal has to do with American government. Personal to me. It has to do with American government. You guys know me. Okay, so a little bit about myself I already shared. My hearing is awful. My memory is awful. Um, and I've been teaching like forever. What's really neat about doing these classes is I'm not teaching, I'm facilitating. Facilitating is a lot of fun because I get to be like, so what do you think? And you guys can share what you think. And there are no right or wrong things. If you have something to say, feel free to share it, even if it's like totally like outside of the box of thinking, share it. Because it, it'll get somebody else to start thinking. Um, and it's really important. I want to hear what you have to what you're thinking, what you have to say. Which brings me to my personal feelings when dealing with American government. Okay? Uh, I grew up with a one-sided view of government. But when my whole family was in this one track. When we went to vote, you had to vote like this whole ticket and when you guys go to vote, you can you can vote like when you when you go in to vote, you can vote for a Republican or a Democrat or independent. You can vote for all of these different people. But when I was growing up, you could do that. But in my family, it was like straight ticket. You you just you can just click on the top thing. It's, it's like you know when you're going to delete emails and you can delete them all. And you click that one box. I can click that one box and, and vote for everybody. Whether or not they were any good, they were in the right ticket. Uh, but as I matured and, and got a better understanding of life in general and a better understanding of politics, uh, I started listening to different people and, and looking at different situations. And there's two things that are really important. Um, I started listening to what people were actually saying. And there, were, there was a president and a vice president that were elected years ago, um, before you guys had any thoughts on this. And I thought, I, I didn't vote for them, okay? But I thought, Wow, 
There are two young leaders with really incredible minds and the, the, the processing that they can do, the direction that they can go, and they were, they were both young and very dynamic. And not a whole lot changed over the course of their political career. But my mind was like, this, this could be incredible, because they're both dynamic. So watch what's going on in politics, and, and watch who is in there running and everything else and what they say. But here's the thing that really message, message to me. Uh, I had become a Christian, a born-again Christian, until I was an adult. I grew up in a, in a church-going family until we reached a certain age. We, we reached an age of um, 13 or 14 years old, I think it was, and we, we made what was called um, catechism, I believe it was. I forget, my mind is so bad. Um, but we reached a certain age in learning about this particular religion, and then we were on our own. My mom was like, want to go to church? Go to church. And so it was something but not like really a big focus. But as an adult, church means a lot to me and God means a lot to me. One thing I found in Scripture was it doesn't matter who your leader is, pray for your leader. That's what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say, condemn this person or condemn that person because they don't believe the way you believe. It says, pray for your leaders. So, as a group, it's important to pray for our leaders. Whether or not we believe the way they believe, whether or not we agree with the foundation that they're trying to stand on, perhaps, just perhaps, by us praying for our leaders, they will, they will wake up to say, oh my gosh, this is wrong, and I need to stand up against this, even though my party doesn't stand up against it. Or I need to make these changes. Or they'll get a better focus on God. So that's my own personal direction as far as American government. Okay, uh, And you will hear pastors tell you all the time, I can't tell you who to pray, who to vote for. I can look at the different foundations that they stand on and lean a certain way because of the foundations that they stand on. But, and every pastor will tell you this, I can tell you, no matter who the leader is, we need to pray for them. And uh, that goes like both ways. Pray for them that if they're a leader that you don't agree with, pray for them that they would make wise decisions. If they're a leader that you agree with, pray for them that they would have enough strength to make the decisions that they know are the decisions that need to be made, even though other people in their government structure disagree with them. Um, so it's, it's like a balance, but that's the key is we need to be praying for our leadership. Okay? So that's where I stand on that. Um, you're going to have your own opinions, and that's really important. And like I said, at the beginning of that whole monologue. You can share your opinions in here and it's safe, okay, it's okay. Do not get complained. You might get into a disagreement with somebody, but don't put them down because you got into a disagreement. Okay. Now I get to put this on the screen. Anybody have any questions, thoughts, ponderings? Ask me.
me if I remember how to do this. You remember how to do this? I will So what did you guys do differently this summer? Did you go away? You work at that, you work at that camp? Yes, sir. Was it fun? It was fun. It was a lot of work. Was it? Long days and a lot of hard work. Were there a lot of people there or no? Um, we don't take more than 12 people at a time. Oh, wow, OK. So, and that's always been the policy because you run out of horses and, and wranglers pretty quick. So that was, that was good. You just get back or? Um, last Monday. Wow. So not, not yesterday, but a week from yesterday. Um, so then we went on vacation, which was nice. Went to golf shows. Really? Yeah. Anybody else? I didn't go anywhere. You didn't go anywhere? I took a skateboarding. That's a good thing. Bruises, yeah. Yeah. You have a helmet and you pass everything where you're going with old school. No, it's not old school. <laughs> Anybody else? I went to Florida. You went to Florida? Where'd you go in Florida? Pretty good. Where's that? Like the sand Okay. Very typical sand handle. So that's where the like white sand beaches and stuff? Very cool. Anybody else? I didn't go anywhere. I worked a lot. You would do what? I worked a lot. Worked a lot? Where'd you work? I worked for a landscaping company. A landscaping company. I need you to come do some landscaping work. <laughs> Did I just mess that up? Can you read that or no? No. no. Yes. Should I back it up? If you want some help. I'm on camera. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Is that better? There's a stuck out of the thing that I straightened it. Feel free to do whatever you have to do. Seven responses to other posts. I, I thought that was, I, I was talking about like 
overall one that says the student is required to complete eight discussion posts yeah, on the presented topic. So it was just one reply by Sunday. And then so seven. The final week of the course is not include a response requirement. So we only so have to respond to Oh. And we had to respond to seven. Well, seven. Well, seven. Well, 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 I Somebody email. Somebody, somebody email your professor and make sure that that's correct. I'm pretty sure that's what it means because it says. Who's, who's going to take that on? Okay. Will will. Is that will will? <laughs> so we need to verify that. But that would be really good. Okay. Makes sense. I did not make this, so I can't honestly say yes or no on that. All right. So we got through the discussion post. The debate forum is 20%. Original post is due on Thursday. Your reply is due on Sunday. Complete six debate forums on the current event piece provided, and then respond to six peers posts. I think I hope that's just whatever. The week that would be the same thing then. Okay. Okay. But let's verify all that just to be sure. Just the discussion post. Your research paper is due week five. 10 pages. On the topic of choice as it relates to a concept learned during a semester. This paper may be written in the style of your choice, though the professor prefers to Arabian Chicago style. Oh. You're here part of the saying I'm late. You gotta scroll around to find that style, okay? The paper <laughs> must utilize at least 10 outside references. There must be 10 pages, not including the cover page and reference page be created and think you need time. I'm going to start writing right now. Okay, yeah. did you kill me right now, Lizzie. <laughs> hey, yeah, like, we can work on it a little bit if you work ahead and you can start now. This is a little like I'm going to kind of work ahead. No, <laughs> no, thank you. So I said, hey. We're not going to do last minute, though, right? And we are. Well, I mean, let's just say you can be saying I'm like, just saying. Uh, you can be saying I'm like 8. Yeah, I yeah. Okay, so are there any questions about that? Oh, but I'm Why? reading the syllabus. I'm reading the syllabus. Why? And uh, we're talking yes. about the discussion thing. You're going to have to speak up loud and clear, remember? Okay, I'm reading the syllabus and where it talks about the discussion, it does look like it's seven responses total in the whole course. Okay. But it's confusing a little bit because no other syllabus has talked about discussion replies like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, if you double check, be sure there. I will. But that makes sense. Okay. Now, uh, when you are responding to somebody, Listen up. When you are responding to someone, I'm going to take away the exemplary stuff. You got to mess with this way. You can respond and you can be polite. Don't respond like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever, seen, ever read, or anything like that. Don't think you're wrong. You can respond and be polite. I can see where you're coming from with that, although I disagree with it strongly. Or, you know, you, you can be respectful in your response. Okay? Uh, so think about that. Really, really be concerned about that. Okay, so no questions with that at all? One of the craziest things that I did when I was a kid, did I tell you this story last year? If I tell you the story, it's about the way I got a good grade on a paper I had to write. Okay, I was in elementary school, okay? And we were doing a book report. We had two book reports on different people. I did a book report on, I think it was on Daniel Boone. And so it was supposed to be 250 words. So 250 words, that just makes sense. So I started writing. And I was the kind of kid that would write three or four sentences, count the number, count the words, and like the last word I would write a little bit of it, like 57, and then continue on writing because I was doing 250 words. That's what the teacher wanted. That's what I would do. It wasn't like at least 250 words. It was 
teacher said 250 words, that's what they're going to get. And so I started writing. Man, I was on fire. Somewhere around that 57 word mark, I ran out of things to say. Totally drawing a blank. I was finished at that point. So I started writing. That's all I really can write about. I know that I'm going to get a bad grade, although I shouldn't get a bad grade because I did try my best. If you give me a bad grade, I won't complain. It will be okay. Counting to do, 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 do. 162. I'm getting there. This is really good. And I started writing again, apologizing, making up all kinds of my excuses as to why I shouldn't get a bad grade. But if I do, I'm not going to hate the teacher. All these different things. I got to like 246 and I wrote the end and I was 248 so I wrote my name and I was 250 and that was my paper. I got a B. <laughs> I think that's pretty good. Do not do that. Okay, that is not what to do it, but it's I mean, it only works in elementary school. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, if he teaches pen or something, I don't know. But it, it works, so that was pretty cool. Okay, so that is it as far as the syllabus silence. We are moving on. Research guidelines. Not the assignment schedule. I don't have the research guidelines. Okay, research guidelines are on my Gradling page. Okay, you guys all go to Gradling, go to the teach page or class page, and I posted like links to everything on there. Later, links to the videos that we're going to watch, just links to everything you need from today are on there. So just go there and just start clicking your way to those links, okay? But the research guidelines are on there as well. Okay, so let's minimize this for a minute. And we'll leave that up there for a second. Actually, yeah, we done. Okay, we're going to go into a discussion. Here's a question for you: Was the United States meant to be a quote-unquote Christian nation? Was the United States meant to be a Christian nation? Yes is not a no. good enough answer. No is not a good enough answer. It, no, it was, it was meant to be a place where you could you could have your own religion if you wanted to. You, you know, it wasn't you weren't forced to have one religion or another. You have the, the right to be able to have your own religion. Okay. You don't have to have freedom of worship. Freedom of worship. Yeah. Freedom of worship. Whatever you. Yes. Do know you got to talk loud, right? Freedom, it's not for them, it's for me. The freedom to worship whatever God you choose, but they were founded on Christian beliefs. And then the founding fathers, at least as far as I know, were Christians. So, okay. So their argument is no, it wasn't meant to be a Christian nation. It was supposed to be a freedom of a little free, be free to worship. Mm -hmm. A free freedom of religion nation. That's okay. what they were trying to get away from was the confinement of what you could and couldn't do, what you could and couldn't, couldn't worship. So if we were to say this is a Christian nation, that would be very exclusive and for what they were just you know, yeah. trying to get away from. Yeah. Okay. So some of you said yes. Have you been swayed to the nose or are you still a yes? Not sure. I mean, I think that's like a very valid yeah. point. But like at the same time, like what I learned is that most of them were Christians and that's why they were leaving because they like didn't have freedom to be a Christian there. At least that's what I learned. They're Christians, right? Like most of the pilgrims? 
Sounds right to me. So I thought they were coming over here so that they could like have freedom. Although they were Christian, they weren't forcing anybody else yeah, to be. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that's. Although they were, although they were building the, this country on Judeo-Christian ethics, they weren't forcing anybody to be a Christian. No. You've grown up a lot since last year. Thank you for your input. Good job. Okay, we're going to learn a little bit more about that. Next question. Does our system of government require, does our system, America's government, require, I can never get this word right, an underpinning, I guess it's underpinning, of religion to be successful? Underpinning would be, you, if you're building a house, you've got to have a foundation for that house to, to stand, correct? You all get that? Okay. You ever watch, um, who, you went to the beach. You went to the beach, okay? Houses right there along by the beach, they have those huge poles dug into the ground. And then the houses are built on those poles. Could you imagine if those poles were two by fours? I just would, would the house stand long? No, the first wave comes through, the house will be gone. Okay, and those poles are dug way down deep. Way down deep. And some of them now are built on concrete. Or look at some of the bridges that they're building. Like the bridges over different portions. Anybody travel from the east side of 400 and drive over those bridges and watch? Have you seen them like driving those poles down into the into the lake, into the water? They go down way deep. That's that's underpinning. That's to give a foundation so that the bridge won't be swayed. Okay, that's what that is. Now, in this question, do you think our government requires a religious underpinning to be successful? No. It doesn't. You don't need to be religious to be successful. I'd say, like, I feel like I don't know. I feel like you can name you know, successful, quote, successful people. You could, uh, you, you could list a name off of, quote, religious or uh, successful people that aren't religious. I mean, it depends on what you count as successful as well. Okay. Money or happiness or, you know. But as a government, not as an individual. That, that's, that's the question. As a government, does government require this religious foundation to be successful? Some things to think about. While we're thinking about those, we're going to look at two quick videos. And then we're going to look at these questions again and have a little bit more of an open discussion on Okay, the first video is, was America founded to be secular? You know what secular is? You do? Everybody? I can't give you a definition of it, like a verbal definition of it, but I have many of co op people who do a class of this. I know, I know, but I know, I'd say, but I just can't, like, I know of it, and I, I can't remember what it is exactly. Well, what's the difference between a, a secular play and a religious play? Or a sacred play? What's the difference between a secular story and a sacred story? What's the difference between a secular song, some of you are musicians, a secular song and a sacred song? Isn't secular just like more worldly, like, just like of the world, kind of stuff like that? Non-religious. Yeah. Non-religious, a guy just wouldn't be a part of it at all. No religion would be. Yeah, just not. Non-religious. should religion play in a free society? More and more people today would answer none. That would 
not have been the answer of the founders of the United States, the men who fought the American Revolution and wrote the country's constitution. To them, the issue of religion and freedom were inextricably linked. You couldn't have freedom without religion. In fact, the political philosophy of the founders necessitated a divine foundation. Thomas Jefferson makes this clear in the Declaration of Independence when he writes that all men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. The purpose of government, Jefferson and his compatriots believed, was not to bestow rights. Rather, it was to protect those rights already endowed upon human beings by God. But government isn't enough for a free society. A moral people is also required. That is, a people moral enough to police itself. Virtue or morality, George Washington observed, is a necessary spring of popular government. Thus, for the founders, liberty was not merely the ability to do what one wanted. It came with moral demands and boundaries. They all accepted the rule of life expressed by Benjamin Franklin. Nothing brings more pain than too much pleasure, nothing more bondage than too much liberty. The founders knew that the absolute enemy of freedom was, ironically, a freedom that was absolute and unrestrained. And where was this restraint going to come from? Their answer was religion, which for them, because of when and where they lived, was some variety of Christianity. Let divines and philosophers, statesmen and patriots unite, Samuel Adams wrote, in instructing citizens in the art of self-government, in short, of leading them in the study and practice of the exalted virtues of the Christian system. The Christian system to which Adams refers is composed of Judeo-Christian values, the values rooted in the Old and New Testaments, both of which were referred to by the founders with equal conviction and frequency. Jefferson, yes, the very same Thomas Jefferson who is so often portrayed as anti-religious, confirmed this sentiment in his notes on the state of Virginia when he asked, can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God and that they are not to be violated but with his wrath? James Madison likewise affirmed the essential connection between religion and morality. The belief in a God all-powerful, wise, and good is essential to the moral order of the world and to the happiness of man. John Adams believed that the doctrine of a supreme, intelligent, wise, almighty sovereign of the universe, a doctrine he credited to Judaism, was the great essential principle of all morality and consequently of all civilization. And he applied this thinking specifically to the new nation he helped to create. Our constitution, he said, was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. As president, he replied to a letter from university students in a way that would surprise many today. Science, liberty, and religion have an inseparable union. Without their joint influence, no society can be great, flourishing, or happy. Meanwhile, another founder, Alexander Hamilton, looked at the French Revolution and saw something much different. That revolution, unlike the American Revolution, had devolved into violence and chaos. Hamilton believed he understood why. The anti-religious force it unleashed, he wrote, annihilates the foundations of social order and true liberty, confounds all moral distinctions, and substitutes for the mild and beneficent religion of the gospel a gloomy, persecuting, and desolating atheism. For the founders, a free society divorced from religion simply could not work and would not survive. It is no wonder then that in his farewell address, George Washington chastised those who would claim to be patriots and yet undermine the influence of religion. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness, these firmest props of the duties of men and citizens. The founders did not demand that anyone believe in any particular religion or even in God. Quite the contrary. But while they understood the value of a secular government, they feared a secular society, one without religion. So should we. I'm Joshua Charles, writer and researcher at the Museum of the Bible for Prager University. To keep our videos free, click here. Let's look at one more. This one is a Christian nation.
United States of America is a Christian nation. If you believe the rhetoric of many Republican political candidates, you certainly think so. Former presidential candidate John McCain once said, I would probably have to say yes that the Constitution established the United States of America as a Christian nation. His choice for vice president in 2008, Sarah Palin, has called the United States a Christian nation and suggested that it's mind-boggling to think otherwise. At George W. Bush's inauguration, his very first act was to have the son of Christian evangelist Billy Graham officially dedicate the presidential inauguration to Jesus Christ, invoking the Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Many U.S. presidents have sworn their oath on the Christian Bible. God bless America has become a familiar slogan in good times and bad, reflected on banners, t-shirts, church marquees, and songs like Lee Greenwood's God Bless the USA. The internet is populated with websites like keepgodinamerica.com, which promotes the Christian Bible and declares that without God, there is no America. You can sign online petitions like this one, which declares that God ordains our leaders for his own glory and the public good. Certainly, the United States protects the freedom of its citizens to call down blessings from their deities, Christian or otherwise. Free citizens have the right to pray, worship, and practice their religions however they wish, within the boundaries of the law. But did our founding fathers create a Christian nation? Well, if they did, it's odd that God is not mentioned once in the U.S. Constitution. The mention of religion in Article 6 of the First Amendment served to separate religion from government altogether. The Founding Fathers actually guaranteed the right of the non-religious to hold public office. And the language doesn't even use the word Christian. It says, religious, covering all faiths. God, Creator, and Providence are mentioned in the Declaration of Independence. However, after Cornwallis surrendered to George Washington at the Battle of Yorktown in 1781, the Declaration of Independence was not the document the Founders used to govern. Instead, they reconvened and drew up a different document to define U.S. laws. First, the Articles of Confederation, then the Constitution. The Founding Fathers didn't put in God we trust on U.S. coins. That was done during the time of the Civil War. They didn't put in God we trust on U.S. paper currency. That was done in 1957. The words under God weren't part of the original Pledge of Allegiance. Those words were added by Congress in 1954 as the West was making a statement against the quote-unquote godlessness of communism by also instituting a national day of prayer and replacing e pluribus unum with in God we trust as our national motto. Contrary to the assertions of the religious, many of our founding fathers were either deist or ambivalent about the Christian God, including Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, John Adams, Thomas Paine, and even George Washington. Thomas Jefferson, a deist, rejected concepts like the Trinity, the virgin birth, the divinity of Christ, the resurrection, original sin, and other core Christian beliefs. Further separating our founders from a Christian nation is Article 11 of the Treaty of Tripoli, signed by John Adams in 1797, which stated clearly that, quote, the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. So, if our founding fathers were necessarily Christian, they excluded God from our Constitution, had nothing to do with any mentions of God in our Pledge of Allegiance, they omitted God from our money, they removed any religious requirements to hold public office, and declared publicly that the United States is not founded on Christianity. Are the politicians and pundits on the religious right being completely honest with themselves and with the public about their attitudes and intentions? Are they attempting to integrate their own religious agendas into a government designed to operate religion-free? Are they using God in an emotional appeal to win support and votes from a largely ignorant electorate? Has Christianity or any other religion contaminated the secular framework for government established over 200 years ago? The next time a politician says that the United States is a Christian nation, it might be a good time to give them and the millions of Americans watching a history lesson.
but that's it. <laughs> so, let's go back to these questions. Was the United States meant to be a Christian nation? No. <laughs> <laughs> Great cowboys, but they weren't founded, maybe, maybe they weren't founded by Christians, but the policies and the, the meaning, or not the meanings, I can't think of the words. The morals, thank you. The morals that our country was founded on and the, um, the documents that hold our country together were written by the laws and all that. Those reflect morals that come from Christianity because the moral sense of it's wrong to kill somebody is from God. And whether somebody is willing to admit that or not, it's not just what you do, it's, it's what you do because we're made by God and you just realize that's wrong. That it's wrong to just kill somebody. So it should be a, a moral compass. Well, the moral compass comes from Christianity. It comes from the Bible. Whether you realize it or not, that moral compass that most human beings hold comes from the Bible. It comes from the laws of the Bible. So it may not have been founded on Christian with you know with the idea of being Christian, or maybe the people weren't Christian that founded it. And maybe they omitted God from the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and all that. But the morals that it was founded on are, I think, totally, totally Christian. Thank you, Bob. Anybody else? How many of you watching that first video? I mean, that first video was, was an older video. But... Weren't, weren't they like projecting today when they were talking about um, talking about the morals and talking about if you throw away your morals, it, it, you just have freedom without any kind of moral compass, then you're on a, you're on a road to destruction. As far as and it would, I mean, it was like wow, this today. I just realized this is probably not the right place to stop this screen while we're talking <laughs> the thinking atheists. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Does our system of government require a religious underpinning to be successful? This goes back to what Will was saying, right? I would say yes. I don't know. I would say yes. I feel like it should be founded on Christian moral. Well, if you look at the second this this film that just ended, they, they talked about how um, there should be no religious test on on any any leadership. Right? Which which basically says no matter what where, where, where this person stands religiously should not qualify them or disqualify them from being in office. And so that's something else to kind of think about as far as our government is concerned. Alright, we're gonna move on. We're running not necessarily sure on time. It is now 10 or 5. We've got about 15, 20 minutes left. Okay. We're going to move on to a topic that I think is really, really important today. Okay. Um, and I'm sure you guys have focused opinions on this. <clears throat> the Second Amendment reads a well regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Such language has created considerable debate. Think about the debates of today. Think about the arguments of today as far as 
freedom to bear arms. Okay? Uh, doesn't matter if you agree or disagree. with the interpretation of the Second Amendment of the United States that private ownership of firearms is permitted or not, everyone can find common ground with their concerns about gun violence. I think we can all agree that gun violence is a bad thing. We just, I just got an email, no, it was a posting on, on social media. A friend of mine, who is a former student, lives in uh, Myrtle Beach area. And yesterday, people that she knows, they, I think there was a car accident. Oh, I saw that. I think there was a car accident. And they got into an argument. You know, you get out of your car and you get into an argument because somebody hit you. You say, well, you weren't even thinking. And they got into an argument. And I don't want to just take out a gun and start shooting people. Okay? If you didn't have a gun, they might have had a, a brawl, but there wouldn't be dead people today, probably. Okay? So, something to think about. Uh, another thing is, is that if there was... Uh, the other thing is, is the other side of the story is, if the other person had a gun, then he wouldn't have done that. They would have shot him first. Exactly. So, yeah. so somebody would have gotten shot. Someone that he was the one that pulled the gun and tried to kill somebody. Okay. It was self defense. It's not their fault. Yeah. Personally, I feel like even if the person didn't have a gun, like if you have the intentions to like hurt harm someone or like, I feel like you're gonna find another way to do it even without a gun. That's just how I feel. So if someone's gonna hurt you, they're gonna hurt you guns are banned. with or without a gun. Guns are banned. The, gun the gun just happens to be the tool at hand. Yeah. Guns are banned in the UK, and yet they still use baseball bats and knives and car bombs and everything else. So True. Outside of okay. And the other side of that also is, if somebody wants a gun, they're gonna find a way to get a gun. Yeah. Even if it's banned. Okay. So. The scale of this issue is enormous in the United States. It's, it's really big. Even though there's like a 20-year downward trend uh, as far as gun violence in a lot of communities. So for 20 years, there's been this trend of less gun violence. But there's still a lot of gun violence. The fact about gun violence is undeniable. More than 38,000 people died because of gunshot wounds in 2016. Roughly 60% of these fatalities were self-inflicted. So that goes, takes 10 things, gun violence, and almost takes gun violence out of the equation when you think about deaths by gun. Sixty percent of what was the number again? What was the number of overall deaths in 2016? Thirty-eight thousand. Thirty-eight thousand. That was in 2016. So sixty percent of that were found to be self-inflicted. Then there's the argument, well, if they wanted to do something to themselves, they would do something with or without a gun. That's but the gun is a... Well, that, that, isn't the gun more of a... a so it's like just about 15,000 people. It's actually like 18, it's 18, it's 18, it's 36. <laughs> you know, it's 60% people, but we set this up. 38,000, 18 is half of 36. 50%, 18 is... Was it 50 or 60%? 60%. 60%. To be less than 18, right? Six men would be more. South inflicted, yes. I'm talking about non South inflicted. Sorry. Oh. Okay, sorry. I'm saying non South inflicted. It's supposed to be like 50,000. Yeah. 80,000 people survive after being shot each year. 80,000 people that get shot. This is not the people who die. 
80,000 people a year survive gunshot wounds. That's a whole lot of people being shot. Depending on what you shot. Depending on how one defines mass shooting, the United States averages one per day in 2016. Three of the deadliest events that qualify under any definition of this crime happened in 2016 and 2017. Something must have been in the water back then. Okay. There are many solutions being proposed on how to stop. I need somebody to do me a favor. We're probably not going to get to this. Guys, take one of these. Actually, just take one page and pass it around. Should all be able to get a copy of that. Sounds to me like that's against gun control. Yeah. So let's go there. 
Okay. Read, read the first one. The first one? Live here. Only 3% of... Wait, what? Only 3%, <laughs> only 3 of people own 50% of the civilian weapons in the United States. The United States tops the world with the most guns that are owned privately in civilian hands. There's roughly one firearm owned in the U.S. for every person. There are an estimated 101 guns for every 100 people. What? <laughs> the next country that comes even close to this ownership rate is Serbia. That's not what I said. Which has 75, what did you just say? Nothing. Which has 75 guns for 100 people. Only one in four households in the U.S. owns a gun, which means the majority of the quantity of is owned by a relative few people. 3% of Americans own 50% of the firearms. If gun control measures look at future purchases as needed instead of one, it could help to reduce this issue. That is for gun control. It sounds like it's for gun control, right? Let's put that there. Here's the crazy thing about that article. Think about it. It says, for every 100 people, There's 101 guns. Somebody owns two guns. So every it says there there are there, for every person that's living in America, there's a gun. On. Plus one. Okay. <laughs> so so you never have that's that's mind blowing. But then three percent of the people own. 50% of the guns. I know he went to my boss. He owns like hundreds and hundreds. But he's in that 3%. Yeah, he is. Okay. He is. Three percent of the people he's own 50% of the guns. So so take that 50% out of that equation. But only take three percent out of out of that. You know why the Japanese didn't make a land attack on America? Because they thought everybody owned guns. Because everybody did own guns. There were way too many hundreds. It would have been dangerous. That's right. It would have been suicide. Think about that. Suicide. But 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 now, but now if you think about it, this three percent have like heavy artillery. <laughs> you know, they own fifty percent of the guns. It's that, that just when I read that, I was like, that is just mind blowing. Okay. And how many of you know somebody that owns a gun? Okay, so we all know somebody that owns a gun, and yet only 3% of the people own 50%. That's crazy. Okay, okay. what was it? it was in the so that was four. Majors. Uh, measures to gun control create a violence of privacy. Gun control measures may have the best interest of everyone in mind, but it is also an effort to reduce the amount of privacy that is available in society today. If micro-stamping efforts, licensing, or other forms of coding are instituted to track guns, then it would create a privacy issue where a database search would offer access to more information than anyone needs about a legal gun. Sure. 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 So is that for or against? Honestly, against. Against. That sounded like it was against. Okay. Ah, uh, are they needing to come in this room? Uh, Mr. Vulture was looking at me. Okay. <laughs> so, so, I, think it, when I, I think we're supposed to go to 25, aren't we? Right? Right. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. 25. I'm terrified. Right? <laughs> Be careful what you say anymore because we're on camera. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Do you need to come in and get set up in here? What time should I finish up? I think 20 after. Okay, I think it was 25 after. I could be wrong. Well, we could, wrong. Be, could be wrong. Uh, okay. There are, this, this, I don't have all of these online. I can put them on, on our grade link. Okay, I'll put them on our grade link. I'll put the video about gun control on there as well. Alright? Uh, any questions that you have during the week? If you have a question about your work, do not send it to me. Okay, send an email to your professor, ask your professor, then send me your question and your professor's response so I can share it with them. Yes, ma'am, loud and clear. I just have like a quick question. So the discussion is more of like what we've learned and like stuff like we can 
put stuff from like the textbook and stuff into that. And then the debate is more of like how we feel about the situation, right? Like what's the difference between the discussion and the debate? What, what two parts are you talking about? Like, you know for um, our assignments how we have a discussion and then we also have a debate? Your discussion and uh, the debate forum are on current event pieces provided. So it's different topics. They're different, totally oh, different topics. So it's just like two discussions, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. Basically, it's, it's two discussions. Except but, in, a, in a debate format, you're going to give the reasons to justify your position. Yeah. You know, so Which basically is still doing. But in, in your discussion, you are citing yeah, okay. specific things that you learn in your text. Okay. Did you create these papers with all these? Did you create these papers with all these? I didn't, but I, I, I have them in the system. Do you have the list of articles that they came from, the sources? I will look and see. If you do, it would be great if you could put that list on your... Okay. Those could be helpful. Yeah. 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 All right. And that work Any other questions or responderings? Guys, it's good to be back in the classroom. You guys did great. Thank you all. Yeah.